crumb thief, wild, brave, daring crumb thief, prince of the mice, strode confidently down that morning to the water's edge of the great lake and took himself a deep, refreshing drink of the crystal clear waters therein. And as he lifted his head, the sun falling down on him, sparkling upon the drops of water, falling from his whiskers, there came a rivet from his side, and looking around, Crumphy, that bravest of brave mice, saw there a frog, fat and green and warty and riveting. And so, Crumphy, being the, the, the gentleman, the aristocrat that he was, introduced himself to this strange Butrachian entity and said, I am Prince Crumfeath, son of the bravest king that Maustum has ever known. And the frog bowed its head and said, I am Puffjaw, king of the frogs. I am most pleased to meet you. And so Mouse and Frog fell to discussing the politics of the day, the comings and goings of the creatures who lived around the Great Lake, and down further to where the sea was some quarter mile away. There the strange stories that emanated up from the coast, for a quarter mile is a long way for both a frog and a mouse, if not for maybe more long-legged species. But all was going well between Puffjaw and Crumfeef. So well, in fact, that Puffjaw said, I, I would like to show you my dominion. I would like to, to, to show you my island. Ah, alas, said Crumfeef, I, I, I cannot swim. I am a creature of the land. Ah, do not worry, said Puffjaw. I have two palaces. I have the water palace below the lake and the land palace above the lake. Because, of course, the frogs were amphibians. They had a flipper in two worlds. And so Puffjaw, king of the frogs, invited the prince of the mice to come and visit his land palace, which was on an island out in the lake. And Puffjaw said to the mouse, if you come upon my shoulders, I will swim across the lake and, and take you to the island. And you may see the magnificent stature of my palace. The columns, the esplanades, the halls, you may see it all and enjoy it all. I will take you around and then one day I will come and visit the mouse palace in exchange. And so it was agreed between the two that this is what would happen. And so the mouse got on the shoulders of the frog and the frog began to swim across the Great Lake. And a wonderful journey it was. The mouse was able to see things it had never seen in its entire life and able to, to marvel at the wonders of, of the lake world. But as they were maybe three quarters of the way across, there reared its head a sinister and evil force from within the lake. There reared its head the great serpent of the lake, the water snake, hissing and spitting and looking hungrily at the Frog King, who panicked as any one would, faced with a predator of such great proportions. And the Frog dived down deep into the lake to save its own life, forgetting it had a passenger upon its back who could not swim. And poor little Crumfeef paddled and, and floundered and, and tried, tried to swim as best he could, flailing his little limbs and his tail and his ears every which way. But it was of no avail. He went down once. He swam up to the top. He went down again. He paddled up to the top. And as he was going down for the third and the final time, that poor little mouse called out for vengeance upon the evil and treacherous frogs, cried to the gods themselves in Olympus high above that this, this murder, this crime, should not be unpunished. And the gods heard. And not only did the gods hear, but another mouse who was sitting upon the banks, nibbling a blade of grass and minding its own business, also heard the, the, the terrible plaintiff death cries of his prince. And this mouse was heartbroken and it went up on its two legs and looked out across the waters and was dimly able to see the paws and the nose 
Old Crumfeast as he went down for the final time, crying death and vengeance upon the frogs who had left him to drown in this wicked and treacherous way. Well, that mouse scurried back across the land to the palace of the mice, and there explained all that it had seen and all that it heard, and maybe added, added a little colour, because stories do get colour in the telly, about how the, the wicked frog king had lured the trusting and innocent mouse prince out into the depths of that foul and reeking lake, only to drown him. In, in, in a, an act of treachery, an act of betrayal, the, the, the likes of which had never been heard. Well, the king of the mice was furious. The warlords of the mice were, were outraged and they said, we must go and avenge the death of our prince. If we let this go unpunished, next they will be taking our women, they will be murdering our children, they will be doing all manner of terrible and wicked things. For look, you see how terrible their king is. Well, if he is that bad, how much worse will those beneath him be if they follow his example? And so the warriors of the mouse kingdom, who were the fiercest mice for many a mile around, donned their armour, made from leaves and twigs, and they sought out their weapons, made from sharp spines plucked from the back of dead hedgehogs. They equipped themselves duly, and they scurried down, crying their, their death chants, their war cries, their battle songs, singing the hymns of the mouse monarchy as they went to the river bank, to the lake bank, there to seek their vengeance upon the evil puffjaw. Well, up in the heavens, the gods had heard the cries and the furore, for the gods hear everything from the tiniest squeak to the loudest roar. They had heard it all and they looked down uh, and shook their heads in, in shock and awe to see the mouse army marching forth. What should we do, said Zeus aloud? Should we let these, these outrageous mice slaughter the poor frogs for the, the foolish mistake of, of one king? Can they blame them all for the deeds of one? Ah, ah, said his wife Hera, have you not punished humanity thusly for the failings of one king or one queen? Have you not wiped out whole cities? Are these mice not doing simply what you yourself have done? <gasps> Zeus was outraged to be held account in this session. He said to, 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 to Athena, come forth, my daughter Athena, you must go down and, and save these frogs, instruct them in the arts of war that they may be able to defend themselves. Oh no, oh no, said Athena. It is not my place to wage war on one side or the other. And of course, Hermes thought to himself, well, I mean, I've seen you take one side or t'other when it comes to Athens, could I say, but one place, maybe more? Mm -hmm. But no, Athena held her ground. It is not my place to take one side against the other, but to watch over and observe the strategies they use to encourage good strategy and to discourage bad. The causes of justice must be fought. We gods must not interfere. And at great length, after an awful lot of toing and froing and grumbling, Zeus conceded that this, this conflict between mice and frogs should be allowed to play itself out without overmuch interference from the gods. And so the Olympians looked down and they saw the frog armies clash with the mouse armies. They saw frog bite the ears off mouse. They saw mouse ram hedgehog's spine into the gut of frogs. They saw frogs dragging mice down into the waters to drown them. They saw gangs of mice dragging frogs out onto the dry land to pinprick them to death with their hedgehog spines, to break their legs with rocks, to wring their necks with their little mousy paws, which is quite hard to do when you think of how big a frog's throat is. The war raged on for hour after hour after hour. The carnage on both sides was terrible. The phalanx of the loyalist warriors of the mouse king approached 
the king of the frogs, who was cornered in a reed bed, marched on, marched on, their spikes raised high, ready to slaughter the, the very miscreant himself, to carry his corpse in triumph back to the, the palace of the mice, to stake the body to a tree that all might see what happens to those who lift arms and, and, and strike blows against the mouse kingdom. But this was too much for Zeus, for the tide had turned and the frogs were about to, to be wiped out. And <sighs> Zeus, as patron of kings and queens everywhere, could, could not stomach to see a monarch so directly held to account for his own silly and unthinking actions. And whilst the rest of the gods were not looking, he stretched out his divine fingers across the land, across the world, and steered a third army of his own, the quarter mile up the beach from the seashore to the lakeside, came the army of the crabs, claws clacking, eyes on stalks swivelling this way and that, and they besieged the mouse army, snipping off legs, snipping off ears, and as much as the mice might stab at them with the hedgehog spines, those spines could not penetrate the, the rock-hard armour of the crabs, until at length the mouse army was routed and fled back to their palace. The crabs would have pursued them, but of course they can only run sideways and it was too much effort to manoeuvre themselves around to go after the fleeing mice. And so they bowed their heads, if it can be said to have a head, to the king of the frogs and the few remaining members of his, his army and scuttled their way back to the seashore. And Zeus, in his heavens, thought that all was right with the world and that peace would now break out after the one-day war between the frogs and the mice. Thank you.